Okay, we're live. Fantastic. Uh, I've got a notebook full of questions here. Uh, the first one <laughs> I wanted to begin with uh, was a bit about Southerton the man, you know, his, his personality, his character. He seems, from his writings and from the public record, to have been a pretty sober fellow. Uh, certainly by the com by comparison with a few of his um, professional contemporaries who led rather wild, li wild lives. In fact, I, I recently came across the manifest for the Alhambra, uh, the ship that conveyed Lily White's 1876-77 team uh, from Bluff to Melbourne for the inaugural test match. And it made yeah. for pretty fascinating reading, uh, more fascinating than ship manifests tend to be. My, my favorite detail, of course, is that this all professional side, uh, every one of them lists their occupation as gentlemen. That's a sweet touch. Um, but then there's the fact that they all lie about their marital status, with the exception of Southerton. All of them are married, uh, but all claim to be single nice. gentlemen, with the exception of Mr. Southerton. On top of that, all lie about their ages as well. Uh, yeah. So Southerton, Southerton really stands out from the crowd there, knowing what we do even aside from that about uh, their complicated domestic arrangements and some of the antics they got up to on tour. So just a bit about, about Southerton on that front. Yeah, he does seem to have been a pretty well-balanced and sober bloke. Um, he, um, by all accounts, he had a very happy marriage. And, you know, he would have been a quite long time married at the point of that tour. Um, there are stories that he would race home after cricket games, uh, although he spent an awful lot of time traveling around the country in different places. There are stories that he was quite keen to get home. Um, if he had to put a, an occupation down, then certainly in the censuses, he's recorded generally as a hairdresser. Uh, that was the other way he made most of his money. Um, in other, other ways, in terms of his character, I would say he got on with people very well. So he was very well liked, um, despite falling out with some people uh, at certain times. They still remained friends in the, in the longer run. And I reckon he comes over as pretty stubborn. You know, if he thought he was right on something, he, would, he wouldn't give in. You know, he would be very hard to change his mind. So even on some things, I think, where he was probably in the, in the wrong, um, if he believed he was right, he would just, you know, maintain that position, um, whatever the facts. Perhaps, but, you'd, you perhaps you'd like to elaborate a bit on, on that point. He, he had a few um, run-ins with authority, didn't he? He did. I mean, he was, uh, it's not quite clear what happened. He had some time with Surrey early in his, his Sussex early in his career that ended um, partly because he had some injuries, but it ended in a bad way. Uh, and it's not quite clear why, but he left Sussex. Um, subsequently, he fell out with the East Hants Club in Southampton, where he had a contract. Um, and he left them, basically. He broke his contract with, with the East Hants Club to go to play for Surrey, where he could earn more money. Um, and he, But he was the one who took East Hants to court in Southampton, saying that they owed him money. So despite the fact that actually the games in question, he'd broken the contract, he was claiming money for, um, for, for, for providing other kind of net bowlers. Um, it's pretty clear that he was in the wrong and the case was found against him um, and he was ordered to pay costs. But basically the East Hands Club <laughs> didn't pursue it and, and, and footed the, foot the bill. And they remained on friendly terms with him. So um, there, you know, there's just something there that if he thought he was owed money, and he was a professional, he needed to earn money. If he thought he was owed, owed something, he would pursue that. Um, but he seemed to do it in a way that um, did not cause personal problems for him. You know, he remained friends with the people at East Hams. Right. Yeah. I mean, reading about that episode in your book, I was put in mind briefly of um, Sidney Barnes, of course. Uh, his independence of spirit likewise there, there are a few nice. echoes there but w without the, the, the same surliness of character that that didn't endear him to, to several of his contemporaries Southerton seems to have been universally loved in fact you you tell a great anecdote I think via Charles Alcock about um, what a warm and lovable figure uh, Southerton could be 
So is that the one where, I mean, Southerton brought back from one of the trips to Australia, he brought back a, um, a pillbox um, and uh, he, he gave it to Charles Alcock as a present and it had been inscribed for him. Um, and, I mean, Alcock didn't want to take it, but uh, Southerton insisted. Um, and Southerton wasn't a rich man, but he, you know, he did give these gifts away. Uh, and Alcock treasured it, and it seems that many years later, he still carried it on his uh, on his on his body. So um, there was something there that they they liked and respected uh, each other, and that seems to be a general position that Southerton was respected for his cricket, but also for for the way he he held his way his manner. Yeah. Another clue as to his independence of spirit, of course, we get in the subtitle of your book, "The Man of Many Counties." Uh, perhaps you'd like to elaborate on that a bit and tell us um, why that nickname came about. Pretty self-explanatory, but uh, perhaps give us a bit of a, a precy of his um, his various engagements. I, basically, Sullivan would play cricket for whoever would employ him, I think. Uh, he played lots of games for many, many different clubs, but at county level, he was born in Sussex. He was born in Petworth, so he was eligible to play for Sussex, and they could claim him as as as, as, as the home county. He played for Surrey on the basis that that's where he lived, because he lived for most of his life in Mitcham. Um, and he played for Hampshire because he had that contract, which took him to East Hampton, which took him to Southampton. And Hampshire were on the brink of resuming a kind of first-class county career, so he 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 would play for Hampshire. Um, he started, his first games were for Sussex, he then played for Surrey and then East Hants and then went back um, to Sussex and Surrey. And he ended up, I can't remember which year it is, um, but he ended up in one season, he played for all three counties in the same season. Um, and he played for Sussex firstly because they would call on him, uh, they had the first call on him because that's where he was born. But he would also play for the others, and in, in that season, he he was playing against teams that he, he a couple of weeks later um, he had played for. Um, so it was quite a remarkable career in that sense. Um, do when you not say, to, sorry, um, do you not say at one yeah. point that that he was part partially responsible? His example, at least, was partially responsible for the tightening up of qualification rules, the sort of thing that that made uh, Lord Harris and Lord Hawke um, infamous in later years. Yeah, I think he was one of the players who who was responsible for the for the changes. Um, you know, he was in a position that uh, one week he'd be playing for one team, and then a couple of weeks later he'd be playing for the opposition, basically. Um, and he played against teams like Kent, for example, week after week he'd be appearing in Sussex to, Sussex ranks or in Surrey's ranks against Kent, um, and it caused a bit of bad feeling um, in the opposition who'd be playing him time after time. Um, and it was one of the things that contributed to the fact that, that the, the regulations were changed. And eventually he had to choose his county. He had to choose who he wanted to play for. And at that point, he chose Surrey. Right. Uh, and there's another side of his life, of course, less appreciated than it should be, I think. Uh, his journalism. Uh, would you tell us a bit about your forthcoming project, which ought to do a bit to resuscitate his reputation in this department? Yeah, I mean, he wasn't um, a particularly highly educated man, um, but um, he was, I think, reliable. Um, and he was employed firstly by the Sporting Times, I think it was, to write back to uh, the newspaper in England on W.G. Grace's tour of Australia in 1873-4. And then in 1876-7 on Lily White's tour, um, he sent letters back um, for the sportsman. So every couple of weeks or a few weeks, these these letters, these long you know, um, screeds about the about the tour and about the matches would appear in those newspapers. Um, and personally, I think they are better written than you might have expected from from someone of his background. Well, they're, they're certainly um, more interesting and more entertaining than uh, James yeah. Lily White's um, submitted to one of the rival papers and slightly expanded for publication in his uh, journal at the end of the year. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they give you some you know, details of the games, but they also tell you a bit about what they were doing and the places they went to uh, and the uh, sometimes uh, horrendous travel 
experience that they that they all had. Um, and I think so. I, I definitely think that they're worth a read, um, and and you know, relatively well written. He he seems to have got a reputation in some quarters for 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 not being very interesting. I'm not quite sure where that comes from because to me, I think there's a lot there. That is, it gives you a lot about social history, about as well as the cricket, and I find that fascinating. Right, and of course, he passed on his writerly competence to his son, didn't he? He did. Sidney Sullivan became um, an editor of Wisdom. Um, so, yeah, he passed on a love of cricket and and uh, and a writing ability. Yeah. Uh, now it's often claimed that uh, Test cricket's oldest record its most enduring one, at any rate, uh, belongs to Charles Bannerman, uh, famous for his 165 retired hurt in the inaugural test, which famously comprises more than 67% of uh, the very first test innings. But in fact, that's yeah. not the case, is it? James Southerton, uh, when he stepped out onto the pitch the day before the conclusion of Bannerman's innings, was at, let me see, 49 years and 119 days old, uh, test cricket's oldest debutant. He remains Test cricket's oldest debutant, does he not? Uh, although I should say he too lied about his age on the Alhambra manifest, claiming to be 40, 46, although that would still leave him in, in, in the top five um, uh, on that record. Uh, it's appropriate that he holds this record, of course, because as your book shows, yeah. he was a very late bloomer, wasn't he? Yeah, he. Um, I think he does remain the oldest male Debutant. I think the record may have been broken in the ladies' game now, uh, in recent years. But you know, he he holds that record. He holds the record of the first Test cricketer to die as well. Um, so, um, so in terms of yeah, his development of his of his bowling ability, it did came come very very late. He started out as a batsman, um, and had a reasonable reputation. That but that's how he was first chosen in county cricket. Um, and when he bowled in his early years, he was a medium fast bowler. So he developed his um, slow bowling um, after the regulations were changed. What was this in the 18, um, early 1860s? Yeah, um, to allow bowling um, for, from, a, from a greater height. Um, and he he developed a new a new style of, of, of off-spin, um, right-hand off-spin, um, which previously wouldn't have been allowed. Um, and he was he was very old when he came back and uh, and started um, with, with that new bowling. And he had great success. It I kind mean, of stands to reason, doesn't it? Anyone who's who's tried to bowl off-spin will find that, that a high action is pretty much a requisite, isn't it? You you yeah. almost you cannot bowl off spin round arm, can you? Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, spin bowling in effect was something that was new, and um, he so he had a, a number of hugely successful seasons when players were trying to get used to this this new style of bowling and the spin that he put on the ball. Um, by reputation, he wasn't quite as accurate as Alf Webb, um, but he put a lot of spin on the ball and he he changed his style or his speed an awful lot. So, um, you know, he was one of these bowlers who was, it just seems he was a thinking bowler who was always thinking about how to get someone out. Bowled with his head, the as the Victorians like to say. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, um, yeah, he just had huge success for a, whole, for a number of years through the 1860s. Um, taking a couple of hundred wickets, um, well, more than a hundred uh, wickets every season, and I think he was the first bowler to take two hundred in a season. So, um, yeah, he was he was in his forties basically at this time, um, but uh, but hugely successful with this new style. One byproduct, of course, um, of his late blooming as a bowler is that his reputation as a batsman somewhat suffered. In his youth, he was fairly handy with the bat, but now he's judged on what he was doing with the willow in his mid to late 40s, isn't he? And he, he yeah, really quite fancied himself with the willow, as you show. He did. There are quotes from him where he was really quite disappointed about the fact that his his batting wasn't rated, and he obviously thought he was he was better than that. Um, that is the way he started. 
Um, and I think even someone like Charles Alcock acknowledged at one point that, yes, he did rate him as a bowler. Sarlton was complaining to him and, and Alcock said, no, he recognised that he, he he was a decent batsman. And he, and he did um, have times when he would go in, you know, even 10 or 11 in the order and score some useful runs. Um, I think he also managed to hit the ball out of the oval at one point. Um, you know, so so he obviously he could bat. Um but increasingly, he was regarded as as, as, as as just a bowler. A mighty smite to hit it out of the oval in those days. Uh, George Bonner famously lifted one into the deep, 120 metres only to get caught in the fence. So you, right. you had to give okay. it a fair tap in those days to get it out of the oval. Um, and one of the most famous stories about Southerton actually involves his batting. He he was he was once uh, he was run, once retired in in rather interesting cir circumstances. In fact, something happened last summer on air. I don't know if you if you saw Temba Bavuma's dismissal. I think yeah. it was during the Sri Lanka series in South Africa when he, he missed the ball by by a margin of in inches and was the only man on the field who who thought he'd hit it and uh, yeah. tucked his bat under his arm and walked off. And I remember thinking to myself. Surely that should be retired too. It's it, it's if the umpire doesn't think you out, you're out. The fielding side doesn't think you're you're out, and you're the only one who does. You're retired, aren't you? Well, it, it, in Sullivan's case, it went down in the scorebook. Apparently, he was retired, thinking he was caught. Um, but this was um, this was around 1870, and he was playing for Surrey against the MCC, and it seems that he he hit a ball. Um, pretty much into the ground in front of W.G. Grace, who who claimed a catch. But Grace always said he was. this was just a joke. He was just having Sullison on because he, he, he thought that Sullison often batted with his eyes closed. Um, and um, the catch was claimed uh, and Sullison walked off. And although Grace and all the other players and the umpires tried to call him back, um, Sullivan kept on walking and wouldn't come back. So um, I think again, this is another sign of his stubbornness. <laughs> you know, if he thought that something had happened and he'd done, he'd made it his decision. He stuck with it. But it's um, yeah, it's an unusual occurrence. Just as he was the oldest Test debutant, he is ironically he 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 is ironically also the first Test cricketer to die. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a there's a morbid appropriateness about that. Well, he was only what 51 when he passed. Perhaps you'd like to say a bit um, about um, his final years. Yeah, 52 or something like that. So, um, I mean, he he had that tour um, with Lily Lily White to Australia and New Zealand in 1876, 77, and he came back to England and resumed playing for for Surrey. So he had another couple of seasons playing for Surrey. Um, and then he had a, he had a benefit with Surrey, um, and then basically he did retire, um, and that retirement I think lasted less than a year. He he was engaged to Surrey as a net bowler, so he would um, he, he'd go in for that, and it seems that he caught a chill, um, and uh, went home to Mitcham, um, and this developed, and he died um, quite quickly. Um, uh, 1880 of pleurisy I think it was it was then diagnosed so yeah he um, he was only 52 um, and um, yeah was was greatly mourned by Mitcham people in particular there was a long trail a long procession of Mitcham local people followed his um, his uh, the coffin to the to the church the parish church in Mitcham and a great many cricketers um, uh, from Surrey and elsewhere attended the funeral as well. So um, it seemed to have happened pretty quick, but I think things like that did did in those days. And finally, maybe you'd like to say a bit about the origins of your interest in Southerton. I know yeah. you have a, co a connection to the Mitcham Club. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm currently treasurer at Mitcham Cricket Club and um, also one of the coaches for the junior sections. Um, and on Mitcham Cricket Green, um, there is a memorial to famous Mitcham cricketers of the past, and it includes James Sullivan's name. And that sparked my interest a number of years back when I was just trying to write up some brief lives of, of the, the number of cricketers that were recorded on that stone. Um, and seeing that Sullivan had played in that first ever test match, 
um, and also had owned the cricketers pub just across the way um, from the cricket green in Mitcham I just delved into that further and that kind of just proceeded and found out that he'd written these various uh, articles for the newspapers um, and that that just kind of developed into writing up more about his life it, it seemed, I was surprised that there wasn't um, a fuller biography of him to be honest and I thought he deserved one so um, that's what I proceeded to to, to produce and maybe so a bit have... about your your writing process and and the research and uh, the challenges you encountered in the course thereof oh I'm afraid we've just had a power yeah. outage here but fortunately um my my modem's backed up by battery so we should be okay right okay um so yeah he, he's a he's one of those people that I couldn't find anything in terms of um living descendants and 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 Kind of personal writing um so there's, there's elements of his life which are still a bit difficult to get into but there is um a lot available because of his his articles back to the newspapers um so the tours to australia and australia new zealand are recorded in his writing um he was well liked by contemporaries so you have writing from wg grace and others who refer to him because um because because he he was you know their opponent so so that you have their kinds of um views of him um and obviously there's a huge amount of material in terms of the matches he played you know which just gives you scorecards um and that is all very dry so i've tried to supplement that kind of material with what you can get from his writings and other sources so it still means there are bits of this that are a bit of a gap. It'd be nice to have more about his personal life, but I think you can get enough to see something of the man he was um, and why he was so well, well respected and liked. It's interesting reading old cricketing reports. They almost um, filled the role that radio does today, uh, the detail they go into. If, if you were to read um, a sufficient number of, of reports on any given cricketer's career, you, you could form, I think, a, a fuller picture than you could of many players now, even from the, from the 50s or, or 60s, you know, uh, the composition of, of, of really in-depth um, statistical material of the kind that, that the nerds at, at Crickfizz thrive on, you know. I've always, I've always found that really interesting. Um, is there anything else you, you, you'd like to bring to people's attention? Um, I think we probably covered some of the key stories um, about him. Um, no, I, mean, I think that the the really the interesting thing is um, his position for us as a Mitcham cricketer. Um, you know, he played frequently on Mitcham cricket green. Um, so even at the end of the season, um, he'd come back to Mitcham and play for Mitcham club and play in games. Uh, fathers against sons and um, his sons as you said one of them Sydney went on to become a, an editor of wisdom but he also had other sons who who played cricket continued to play for Mitchum for many years um, so I think I think that's a, that's kind of it I, I just think he's a name of someone who deserves to be a little bit more recognized for his his considerable achievements of course, it was uh, uh, through Mitchum he actually retained a pretty close connection with um, his Australian opponents, didn't he? Uh, they were out to begin every tour there. Yeah, they, yeah, you're right, absolutely. So I think the first Australian tour, um, other than the Aboriginal one, was in 1878, and um, they they stopped at Mitchum. They stopped at Sullivan's Pub after playing uh, against Surrey. They won the game in two days, and th on the third day, they they um, drove to Sullivan's Pub in Mitcham on their way to the Epsom Derby. So they stopped there for a few drinks with Sullivan. Sullivan had written very favourably about the standard of cricket in Australia that he had encountered. Um, so I think they were quite well disposed to him, um, and they stopped at Mitcham, and it began a tradition of the Mitcham of the Australians when they came on tour starting some of their practice by going to Mitchum Cricket Green for, for practice. Um, that went on into the 1890s, I think. Um, so unlikely to be to be to, to resume, but it, it was there for quite a while. And um, they clearly liked and respected Southerton as a cricketer and, and, and as a man.
Right. And finally, I've said finally several times now, but really finally this time, uh, where can people get uh, the your biography of Southerton? And when will your anthology of his writings be available? Yeah, so the book about Southerton, I have a copy. Um, James Southerton, The Man of Three Counties is, is available through um, through Amazon. So you can buy it um, online through that source. Um, the next book is is his writings um about the 1876-1877 tour um so it's re reproducing the 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 letters that he sent back to the to the sportsman but also with some notes that i've added in terms of the places that they went to and some of the incidents and the um uh, the people that they met um that is very near completion um, probably, as you know, it often often takes a while to get these things completely finalised. Um, but I hope that it will be available towards the end of this year or the start of next. Um, and that will probably be available through the Mitcham Cricket Club. Um, and with in each of these cases, the the profits, you know, over and above the the publishing costs, um, go back to to Mitcham Cricket Club. Um, so that's likely to be made available fairly soon, next few months. Um, and I hope that people will find it interesting. I hope so too. I'll, I'll have this, uh, this video transcribed and, um, and turned into an article for Cricket Web as well. So hopefully we can get it, yeah. um, get it read a bit more widely as well. All right, I think we're, we're sorted. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Rob. And do keep in touch. Just, I'll let you yeah. know when those diaries show up. Yeah, I, I, it would be really nice. And if you need someone to go up there and have a look at them, <laughs> let me know. I don't know when your next going to be over. I've, I've managed to, to give the people at Nottinghamshire a physical description of them, um, courtesy right, of, okay. of, a, of, a, of a prior scholar who'd worked on them. Um, yeah. they, they seem to have been absolutely tiny, uh, barely A5 yeah. uh, sheets of paper. So I, I imagine yeah. they're at the back of some shelf in, in that chaotically organized library. I'm sure they'll yeah. turn up soon. Yeah, it would be nice just to have a chance, wouldn't it, to, to look at them and see if there's anything else in there. They've been mined mainly for what they say about W.G. Grace, I think. Yeah, well, um, maybe, maybe you should you, you should relay what they say about W.G. Grace for the benefit of viewers and readers. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do say that he, he said in the diary that W.G. G. Grace was, was a, a damn bad captain. Um, I think partly this was Sullivan feeling that he hadn't been bold enough on the 1873-4 tour. Um, and of course, there were all those problems with the amateur professional distinction on that, on that tour. Um, so there were some problems there. But um, there's clearly also a, a, a great deal of respect between the two. I mean, obviously, W.G. Grace was just renowned in terms of the batting ability, and he was a huge draw for people. Um, and he did he did play in Southerton's um, testimonial game. So, you know, he had good things to say about Southerton, even if um, even if he, th he thought that Southerton batted with his eyes shut. In fact, we owe to those diaries one of, one of the least flattering uh, vignettes we have of WG. On the voyage out to Australia, we have WG getting uh, drinking enough to, to drown a calf and um, mowing down flocks of birds with a rifle, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, he doesn't come out well in some of those no, he stories. Does not. Um, but uh, I think W.G. Grace was someone who you, you didn't want to um, be too disparaging about. I mean, Southern says these things in his diaries. Right, exactly. Um, they don't appear in, <laughs> in the written articles that appear in the press. Um, I think um, Grace's contemporaries knew where their bread, bread was buttered and... Um, uh, knew that Grace was a great draw and an attraction for, for crowds. So uh, um, someone you wanted to be on the right side of. All right. Thank you, Adrian. I need to <laughs> fumble about in the dark and, and work out how I'm going to get some work done this evening. Yeah, yeah good, good luck, luck with, with that. that. All right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Great. Cheers. Go well. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Thank, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.